we're going to get started because we're running late, so let's get going. Uh, the Cloudflare folks here have been doing a lot of uh, contributions to eBPF land in a way that's very significant and non-trivial, and they're going to talk to us about programmable socket lookup with uh, BPF. So give them a round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Lawrence. Um, this is my colleague Jakob, and we both work for Cloudflare. And today we're going to talk about um, how we want to extend Socket Lookup with BPF. So first, I'll um, explain a little bit what our problem with the traditional kind of Socket API as it is um, right now. And then Jakob is going to talk about our proposal, how we want to extend um, the Socket uh, Dispatch with BPF. Afterwards, he'll talk about the user space API that our current RFC patch set has. And then finally, um, he'll cover the next steps. For a little bit of context, um, Cloudflare you can think of as a gigantic reverse proxy. So we terminate HTTP traffic, HTTPS traffic, TCP connections on our edge. We perform security optimization on them, and then we sell that as a service to our customers. And to do this, we literally use millions of IPs, any casted IPs. Um, I had a look. Um, currently, that's around 160 distinct prefixes across IPv4 and IPv6. Um, we have about 10 daemons that we expose to the public internet, roughly. Um, and kind of one interesting quirk of our setup is that all machines run all services. So it's not like distinct machines have, you know, we have a DNS cluster. No, everything runs everywhere. So really, in our mental model, we think of services running on prefixes and not on individual IPs. And this creates a problem. It breaks the traditional socket API for us. Let me explain why that is. So the easiest, kind of the, the common case is you do a bind or listen uh, to a socket, and that means that for a given IP address and port, you receive um, packets on that socket, which works fine. Um, however, if you want to do this on you know, a subnet, like um, 256 IPv4 addresses, that becomes difficult. The really simple solution might be to just create 256 different sockets for each uh, IP. We'll create one. Um, and we tried this. However, uh, that doesn't work too well. So we end up creating too many listening sockets. It ends up creating latency spikes. Um, and there's a great blog post by Marek. Um, that explains what happens. So this doesn't work. Um, another option might be that we could just listen on any. Um, so we could create a single catch-all mapping um, for this specific port. Um, it doesn't matter what the destination IP is, we'll still receive the traffic. Um, of course, this doesn't work again, because, as I mentioned earlier, we have all services running everywhere. And for example, we run a public DNS resolver called uh, 1111. Uh, on port 53 on one prefix, but on another prefix, we might be running our authoritative DNS server. So problem so far, we can't really bind to prefix. It doesn't exist as a concept. So we came up with an idea, fairly simple one, which is to add another SOC opt, and the SOC opt allows us to bind to prefix. So you can create a socket that listens on a specific prefix, and you can create many of them. Uh, that fixes our problem. And we proposed this as a patch set to um, Upstream Linux. And then uh, it didn't work out that well. <laughs> Let's update the slide. Well, we can't upstream as a bind to prefix, which in the end wasn't too bad. We, we, the patch isn't that big, so we ended up just kind of carrying it in our own kernel. And uh, we're using this in production. It works well. However, we hit another problem, which is maybe even more exotic which is that we want to bind to all ports. So port any, if you want to, if you consider it that way. Um, and this is because we offer a TCP reverse proxy, which needs to work, uh, work on all given ports, because our customers might run applications on all of these ports. Again, we might do the naive thing and just do 65,000 listen uh, calls and create these sockets, but we just run into the same problem as before. We have too many listening sockets. So we can't really bind to port any. What do we do? We find another hack. Um, there's a fairly obscure 
um, IP tables action, which is called tproxy, which I think stands for transparent proxy. And the idea is that in the firewall, we can inspect a packet buffer. We can look at its destination IP address. And if it matches any rule that we want, we can force it to go to a specific magic socket that we've set up previously. This works brilliant once you get it to work. Uh, doing that is a bit involved. So another plug for blog post here. Um, but it works for us. We have this kind of m to m web, one mapping. We can create it multiple times. Um, everything is well. Except that tproxy wasn't really designed for this. Um, as far as we can tell, the idea behind tproxy is to intercept traffic that is not destined for the machine that you're running on. And then you can feed it into something like Squid to do you know, transparent proxying, or you can deny a request if you want to. However, we ended up using it by intercepting traffic that is actually for the local machine. And that creates a few drawbacks. First, you need to set this socket option, um, which um, tproxy forces you to set. Um, and this is, comes, I think, from the assumption that I mentioned that traffic isn't local to the machine. For our use case, we don't need it. So if we remove that restriction from tproxy, it would still work. However, as it stands, setting IP transparent um, means that we need CapNet admin, so we kind of need to uh, work around this in our daemon. Second, the IP table setup is kind of difficult and fiddly to set up to get it to work right in all of the circumstances that you would um, expect it to work. Third is that um, the performance on a SYN flood is a bit problematic, apparently, um, due to the way it's implemented. And finally, um, it also creates an inconsistent view of socket bindings. And I think we could live with the first two problems. We've already solved them. And so we have the daemon. We've set up IP tables or the firewall. Um, the third problem is fixable um, by investing time and in improving the implementation. Um, but the fourth problem is really um, a really big deal breaker for us. And then Jakob is going to explain a bit more why that is. To get back to our problem slide, uh, we kind of made it work, but our use case is really a massive hack. Um, so we'd like to replace this with something better. And I have to admit that I lied a little bit earlier when I said that our SL bind to prefix was rejected because um, the email is much longer. There's some interesting suggestion here which I want to share. So instead of adding SL bind to prefix, we should add a mechanism using BPF to achieve what we want. And that's exactly what we're proposing here today, and that's what Jakob is going to tell you about. Thanks, Lawrence. So let's set some context first. For our application to actually receive a packet, we need to go all the way through the ingress path and end up with local delivery. So we start at the next ring buffer, go past the XDP hooks, undergo ingress policing by traffic control. Then we need to hit a bunch of net filter hooks that can drop the packet to finally make a routing decision for local delivery, filter some more, and then finally pass it to protocol so that it can look for a suitable socket to accept the packet. And this stage, the socket lookup, is one we are finding most limiting at this point for our use cases and one we are trying to extend. So what we are proposing is to add a new mechanism that lives inside the socket lookup and allows you to steer new connections to any listening socket leveraging the parts of BPF. We're trying to distill what tproxy does for the local delivery use case that we are leveraging and replace our custom bind to prefix solutions. The established connections should, should work as, uh, without problems, and we'll show you how we can gracefully integrate it. So here's the idea. We express the mappings between addresses and ports and sockets that should receive these packets with BPF code. We let the program decide that based on packet headers, which listening socket should receive the packet. So like in this example, we can have all packets going to a network prefix be delivered to one listening socket, while 
all the other packets going to some network address on all ports be delivered to another socket. But before we go into details of how, how we propose to implement this, let's talk a little why it makes sense to program this inside of socket lookup. Well, as it turns out, other parts of the network stack can actually call into the socket lookup to check if there are any services listening for on a given address. For example, XDP-based load balancers will actually make a socket lookup to base their decision whether they should pass the packet up the stack or maybe redirect it to another machine. Same thing can happen on TC ingress. Uh, it can also base its decision on the outcome of socket lookup. And there are other parts, other types of BPF programs from C group BPF family that have this help, uh, helper available to them as well. But that is not all. So the net filter rules, they can also base their match outcome on the outcome of socket lookup. So by programming the socket lookup itself, we make these mappings of destination addresses and ports visible to all other parts of the network stack. So let's see how we can implement it without breaking how socket bindings currently work. This is how socket lookup in TCP is at the moment. It's split into three stages. First, we're gonna try to find an established socket by doing a four tuple match. If we fail to find one, we're gonna look for a listening socket bound to the destination address and port that the packet is targeted for. And if we fail to, fail to do that, we're gonna fall back to a port only lookup uh, for any wildcard socket that are listening on all addresses. So what we've done, if we've, we've added a new stage to the lookup that happens right after looking for a connected socket, but before we start looking for listening sockets, we run a BPF program that searches for a socket in a socket array of its own, and if it finds a suitable one, it can terminate the lookup early. So you might ask, why did we decide to do it before looking for a listening socket? Well, that's because we don't want unprivileged applications to bind over the mappings that we create with BPF. We don't want them to be able to hijack any port or address. What about UDP? UDP is a little bit different. So in UDP, the socket lookup is split into just two phases. We don't have a table of connected UDP sockets. So we look for both connected and bound sockets at once with connected sockets taking the preference. And if we fail to do that, we're gonna look for a wildcard socket. So to integrate with UDP and maintain how connected sockets work, we had to make changes which are a bit more intrusive. We've split the first phase into two and added a BPF program in the middle, just like for TCP. So we hook up our program. Let's see how it operates. On input, it receives the IP version, the transport protocol, and the packet for tuple, among other information. The program then accesses an array of sockets to find a suitable socket to accept the packet. And if it does, it returns it on output. How does that translate into code? Well, we need our array of sockets. So we need to declare a map that ties together just an integer index into the array and socket references stored as values. And the second thing we need is the program itself that encapsulates the steering logic. And much like the filter rules, it has two parts. It will have some action statements to check if we are actually interested in the packet, like in this example where we want to match on all packets going to a certain subnet, TCP port 80. 
and then it will have an action statement if the program actually wants to take any action. But we don't return the socket directly from our program. Instead, we call it into a helper and pass an index into the socket array to that helper, and the helper will select the socket to be an outcome of a socket lookup for us. The helper also re returns an action code for redirection to take place. So as I just mentioned, if all goes well, we return action code for redirect, but things can also go wrong during that operation. Well, there can be no socket in the array under a given index, or it might not be accepting the IP version of the packet, or the transfer protocol might be completely different. In that case, we get an error, and the semantics here are really similar to how Railsport programs select their sockets. So how does this tie together to recap? Well, the program is allowed to look for a socket and terminate the lookup early if BPF redirect action code is returned. And in any other case, we fall back to looking for a listening socket as usual. So this is the kernel side of things. Now let's see how we actually put it to use from user space. Well, we need to create an array first for the program to, to use. And there is nothing surprising there maybe except for the misleading uh, map type name because we are re reusing the same data structure as Rayosport programs are using. But once we have that, we need to populate it with sockets. And the Rayosport array imposes a couple of limitations on us. So first of all, the socket has to be already in the listening state before it can be inserted. Then it also needs to have a Rayosport flag set because it was built to set up load balancing groups. Finally, we need to do it from user space. Uh, don't try doing it from BPF because that's not supported. But let's back up a little. We actually need to have a file descriptor for the socket to pass it as value when inserting it into the array. But where do we get the file descriptor from if we are not the network server that actually creates the socket and lessons on it? We'll get back to that in a minute. Assuming we have our array ready and populated with sockets, we load our program and we've added a new program type to indicate its unique purpose. And once loaded, we can put it to work by attaching it. But where do we actually attach it to? Well, if we think about it for a minute, we receive packets from a network device and they end up in a socket receive buffer. Both network devices and sockets are tied to a network namespace. So that means the socket lookup happens in the context of the network namespace. And that is also what we are attaching to. And we are the only other program out there that attaches to the network namespace except for a flow dissector. Uh, one thing to watch out there, you can't actually point to which namespace you want to attach to at the moment. You're always attaching to the current network namespace of your process. And then we also don't allow yet overriding the program. If you want to replace it, you need to do it in two steps by detaching it and reattaching it again. So let's get back to the program of getting the socket file descriptor. Well, as I mentioned, in a typical deployment scenario, we expect that the process that manages and populates the socket array won't be the network server that actually uses the listening socket to accept incoming connections. And it turns out that it's not easy to get a file descriptor from the socket if you're an outside process. Now, if I start, start a network server on my laptop, I can see in ProcFS that there's an entry for the socket and the process has a file descriptor pointing to it. But from an outside, I can't get a second file descriptor pointing to the same socket in any easy way. If I try to open it simply, the virtual SocketFS won't let me do it. So how do we get around that? Well, the easiest way out that we have found is if you're using systemd socket activation. So if you are using socket activation, 
you're not creating the listening socket yourself. Actually, system D does it for you and it passes it to your process as an already open file descriptor. We can use that to our advantage because system D allows you to link more than one service to a socket unit. And both of these services will get a file descriptor for the socket as they start it. So we just add an extra service that is only in charge of taking the socket file descriptor and putting, putting it in the socket array under some known index. In this example, we're not using a numeric index, but we instead we provide a label for our service, which is web server. So that's the easy way we thought of, but there are a couple of other solutions that might be doable, but a below, maybe a little bit more hard. Uh, first, we can think that we can overload the syscalls and hijack the socket when it is ready to be inserted in the socket array. Then you can imagine that you might want to just modify your application so that it sends the socket file descriptor over voluntarily to some other service that manages the socket array. Finally, we have a couple ideas how we could maybe change the socket array API to allow you to insert sockets without the need to, of forgetting a file descriptor, but we'll get back to that. So we've published the RSC version two patches late August, and they're fully functional, but we still have some things to do and ideas how to improve on that. First thing, uh, we need to keep our eye on performance. So we know that a lot of hard work has gone into TCP receive path, so it withstands synflood gracefully. And our code runs on the hot path on the receive path, so, the cost, so having new code there is not free. We don't have any proper benchmarks yet, only early figures. But we're running a flood that, that hits a single core. We see around 2% uh, performance hit when packets per second when a BPPF program is attached and running. Same goes for UDP. And for UDP, we are even more concerned that the cost of having new program there might be a problem because we added another stage to the lookup. So in a similar benchmark, we're seeing about 4% of hit when you have a BPF program attached and a single core is just receiving a UDP flood. And as we, as we get better benchmark results, we're gonna post them following the patches. Some other things we would like to improve on is to provide our program even more information to make a decision. Currently, the program doesn't know for which network device the packet came in, and we would like to change that. Then we're considering of adding one more action uh, for our program to take. We would like to allow it to terminate the socket lookup without providing any socket and without looking for any listening sockets. Um, we think that might be needed to gracefully steer away traffic from services that bind to uh, an address any. Then we would like to iron out this uh, troublesome parts of user space API. There's really no reason we can't allow you to override the program in a single step or uh, let you uh, point to which network namespace you want to attach. Other BPF comments like query already support this. Then there's the constraint of sockets having a RAIO support flag set. Here we are not really setting up a load balancing groups of sockets. So this constraint doesn't make sense and we would like to lift it in some way. Finally, right now, if you're steering new connections with inet lookup to listening socket, we will ignore the fact if your socket is in the socket uh, in the Rayo support group. So the load balancing won't happen. 
Well, we obviously need to fix that to make CryoSport works and be honored by INET lookup. Now, that's something I already mentioned. Uh, in order to insert the socket, you need a file descriptor for it. But we actually don't do anything with a file descriptor. It's just a way to identify which socket we mean. So sockets happen to have another identifier that is unique with, within the network namespace, and that's called a socket cookie. And you can get it over either by running getsocketopt or from sockdiag. We would like to extend the SOC array API to allow you to insert the socket into the array just by specifying its cookie value. We've prepared a demo that shows you how you can program the mappings between addresses, ports, and sockets. Uh, do we have time left for the demo? Cool. Where we go? Okay, so demo was put together by Marek actually, and uses some proof of concept set user space tooling um, that lets you configure that lets you configure mappings between addresses and ports, as I mentioned, and sockets, and change them dynamically during runtime. So if you want to play with all two, because it does several things, it lets you, uh, it has some help that you can check out later. So first thing we need to do is we need to see if what is the state of our network namespace. Well, currently, we don't have any BPF program that will steer packets to listening sockets attached. So let's load something and attach it. Our tool will create all the maps that the program needs and load it and attach it. Um, the program uses three maps. One of them is sock array and the other two allow it to translate or map network prefixes to string service labels and then map these string service labels to indices into the socket array. We can see it's loaded. Uh, BPF tool can help us confirm the same thing. We haven't extended it yet, so the type of program is just a number. Uh, so our BPF program and user space tool and operates on concepts of services which are just labels for your sockets in the socket array, and bindings, which are mappings between address and port pairs and your services. We start with no services uh, configured and no mappings. So let's register a service and call it terminator because it will terminate TCP connections. You can see we've created a service and it has a slot in the SOC array reserved, uh, but there's no socket there yet. So we need to do that now. So let's create a listening socket, insert it into socket array and pass it onto our network server to listen there and accept new connections. So similar to how systemd socket activation does. And this is what our helper here will do. Okay, so we should have our network server listening, where it is, is bound to a port from an ephemeral range. 
So if you, see, if you take a look on the right hand side, I have actually two instances of a port scanner running and they are constantly scanning the loopback interface. Um, the 1.7.0.0.1 address and the other is scanning 1.7.1.1.1. And I have only a couple services open there. Uh, one is SSH and the other one you can see because the screen is too small actually. Uh, but our service is uh, running on a port outside of a scanning range because we're just scanning the first 500 ports. Okay, so we have uh, network server started, we've got the socket in the socket array. Now let's actually uh, redirect some ports and addresses to it. So let's try exposing the service on port 80 on loopback. Now if all goes well, it should show up on the nmap scan, but it doesn't because it's too small. Let me kill one window. As you see, it is really live. <laughs> All right. So port 80 now appears to be open because we configured a new mapping uh, to our socket. Now we can also bind over the already listening services. Let's try binding over our SSH servers. Well, now Nmap stopped showing the SSH fingerprint because there's no longer a real SSH server listening in for a connection, it's just our simple TCP connection terminator. And finally, we can do some interesting things like we can point all ports on a loopback address to this one socket. And we can examine the mappings we have uh, configured and remove any of them. So if we remove the mapping for all ports, it, we will just go back one step. We can do other things, like we can bind a whole subnet uh, on a given port to our socket. And that's why I had two instances of Nmap running, but unfortunately they can't fit on this skin, uh, screen. So if I bind a whole loopback prefix, 443 comes open. And probably the most extreme case, we can redirect all local addresses and all ports to our service. But if we unload the program, all the things go back to their initial state, our listening sockets that we've bound with traditional socket API are still there. So that's the demo. Uh, so as we make progress on these next steps and benchmarks, we will publish uh, next version of our patches. But we would love to hear your feedback, uh, concerns, or questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> any questions? Let me get John first. I had a question about the, the map. Did you happen to reuse any of the SOC map code that we already have? Have you seen that? Yeah. Because um, if you're able to reuse that, we handle all the cases for dynamically um, adding the FDs from the BPF side, which has actually been quite useful for us because then we can attach it from the SOC ops side as well. So when you do like an establish, you can, you can flip it in and, or, you know, or connect or whatever. So uh, just a, an option. You said it was harder, but yeah. sort of the, all the infrastructure is there to do it and handle it, and it's been tested and running for four or five kernel versions now. So. I then definitely need to take a look at that. We haven't, uh, we're not sharing any code with uh, SockMap. But I think, I think it, so at least we tried to make it generic 
And so that the only place that we, we do very specific things for our, um, our use case for the BPF running on e egress and ingress mm -hmm. is, in, is in the TCP BPF files. Mm -hmm. And so you would probably have to change the criteria to do insert because we do a couple of checks on, on update when we do the update. But I think we could probably just pull those out too, and then okay. have your set of requirements in front. And I think it is possible, and it might, it'll, okay. it'll make it easier to add and remove FDs, and also consolidate some more code. So I see. Um, so if I get what you're saying, we should try uh, to use the SOC map data structure instead of SOC array. Yeah, you'll still need to have like your own program name type, right? Because you'll have a few things that are different on the update side, I think, mm -hmm. like requirements. You, like you can do listening and, and sock map. We don't do listening and stuff like this. Um, but th definitely the goal was to make that sort of a generic place to stick FDs that are, that are linked to sockets. Okay. Um, so if it's not perfect now, maybe we can figure out how to make it, make it better so that it would work. Yeah, we'll definitely take a look at that. And cool. we are looking into sock map anyway. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I just wanted to say that I've run into the problem of not being able to open file descriptors that are sockets from proc in the past, mm -hmm. and that would actually be a really nice problem if you could solve that for privileged processes. It would be really nice if you could get a second file descriptor and inspect it. Mm -hmm. So maybe, so you know, if it was like netadmin, then you shouldn't get an error, or for that, you know, get by a cookie or something like that. Okay, so uh, you actually need the file descriptor to do something meaning meaningful with it. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of like socket options that you can't get out of the kernel if you don't have the file descriptor. I see, I see, um, okay. So for debugging purposes, it would be really nice, I think. I don't know, maybe there's some other ways. Um, we thought about extending the, the SOC Diag as well. But so uh, do you recall any uh, previous attempts I should look up uh, I, I don't. on the mailing list? Okay. So you're saying even an idea to take inet diag and pop all the socket option values out in the dump? Okay. I don't know what I think about that. I don't think about would it. it, it, is, it but it, do, it does lead credence to having the actual file descriptor, not some cookie or something. It's not exactly the same thing. Yeah. Would it even make sense to look into uh, virtual SOCFS uh, supporting that? Ooh. That sounds like some hallway talk to me. That's like a whole new idea, right? That would be a really big commitment to start exploring things at that level. Okay. Yeah. Uh, TCP BPF provides listen callback uh, that also has access to circuit cookie. Did you, did you investigate using it? And if you did, uh, did you find any problems with this? Or uh, this sorry, seems I pretty had, relevant. I, I, I had uh, trouble understanding. Can you please, can you re please repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, TCP BPF provides listen callback. So basically on listen, you can do mm -hmm. whatever with, not whatever, but many things with the socket. One of the things you can uh, get socket cookie and mm -hmm. save it in a map. And this seems pretty relevant because you mentioned uh, LD preload for listen and bind. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, did you investigate using it? And uh, if you did, did you find any problems with this? Yeah, we tried doing that. Uh, using TCP BPF hooks would be another way to hijack a socket when it's ready to be inserted into SOC map. And the problem there was that uh, SOC array doesn't allow us to do updates from BPF. Okay. But that can change in the SOC array side, though. So you, we can make SOC array to allow update from the BPF program. There's nothing stop us from doing that. Uh, from uh, improving the SOC array API, you mean? Right. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. We just didn't get time to do that yet. So together with the TCP BPF option, we should be able to intercept all the bound system going to update the SOC array. Yes, yes, and that seems to be playing nicely with uh, uh, zero time restarts because the new process is in the same C group as the old process. So you see both sockets. Uh, but we, we need to work on that more. I'd also suggest using a new BPF map type instead of reuse port. Yeah, it's something that has crossed our minds uh, because the type name is confusing. Uh, and maybe new map type, but sure, 99% of the code, something like that. We're we're going to have to look into that. Aims are important. Exactly. 
Anyone else? Thank you very much. Thank you.